All right, I am going to start with our introduction while people filter in um, so that we don't take up too much time from our seminar speaker today. So Dr. Jackie Gerson, who is visiting us from Michigan State University, where she's an assistant professor um, in earth and environmental sciences, so what I still think of as on campus. Um, but she also has an appointment at the Kellogg Biological Station, um, which is my point of reference for MSU. <laughs> um, she got her uh, bachelor's from Colgate University in New York. So we, have, we were sharing a New York metro area connection this morning. Um, then she got her master's um, from Syracuse working with Charlie Driscoll, which I think was the start of your Mercury work. And then she got her PhD in ecology working with Emily Bernhardt at Duke. Um, she's won all sorts of awards, <laughs> very impressive um, CV, including a graduate research fellowship from the National Science Foundation and the NSF Earth Sciences Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. Um, lots of really great publications and I'm not gonna go through them in favor of giving you more time to talk. So um, welcome, and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, I am getting over a cold, so if at any point my voice starts to trail, just like wave wildly and I will speak louder, but hopefully you'll be okay. Um, it's great to be here and have the opportunity to tell you a bit about some of the research that I'm doing. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some research that I started as a PhD student um, in the Peruvian Amazon, thinking about artisanal and small-scale gold mining, and it's work that I'm still continuing today. Um, so the talk is entitled, Gold Mining in the Amazon, Tracing the Fate and Impact of Mercury Use in Artisanal Gold Mining. And I just want to begin by acknowledging everyone who helped to make this work possible. I had a lot of key collaborators that were really instrumental in, in helping me get the data, people who helped with logistics, um, field work, and lab work, both in the US and in Peru, um, and then a lot of different funding agencies that made this work possible. And I'll be highlighting a few different individuals throughout this talk as well. But I am primarily an aquatic biogeochemist. Even though some of the work I'm going to be sharing with you today is about terrestrial ecosystems, I think really deeply about how the atmospheric um, system, terrestrial system, and aquatic ecosystem are all interconnected. And as a contaminant biogeochemist, what I'll often do is take a stream such as this one and think about what is entering this stream, how much, how is it being cycled through the system, and what are the ultimate impacts of this. And so ultimately what I'm trying to do is to get at something that I like to call bioaccumulation risk, or the risk of a contaminant accumulating in an organism, such as one of these that you see here. And to think about this, we really need to think about three different processes, loading, transformation, and transport. So I'm gonna walk you through each of these right now. So we can begin with a point source of pollution, such as this coal-fired power plant that you see here. It's emitting large amounts of contaminants into the atmosphere. But the risk that's being posed to organisms is not merely dependent on what is entering into the atmosphere. Rather, it's, a, it's dependent on these three individual processes. So first, loading. Loading is merely the movement of contaminants from the atmosphere to land, and it's dependent on a lot of different individual properties of the landscape, such as precipitation patterns, topography, and leaf area index all of which are gonna drive how much of that contaminant moves from the atmosphere to the land surface, whether that's a terrestrial system or an aquatic ecosystem. The next process is transformation, which is merely the conversion of a contaminant from one form to another form. And this transformation can make that contaminant either more or less bioavailable, bio depending on what the nature of that contaminant is. And transformation is driven by element interactions, temperature, mean residence time, amongst other things. And finally, the last uh, process is transport, which is merely the movement of a contaminant from one location to another. And this can occur such as by animal dispersal, wind, or surface water. And so when we merge all of this together, we get this contaminant risk landscape. 
In other words, we can think about how loading transformation and transport collectively are driving a particular risk of a contaminant entering into organisms. And doing so requires merging perspectives from geochemistry, ecosystem ecology, and toxicology in order to understand where and when on the landscape is most at risk for a contaminant to enter into an organism. And so I hope that by the end of my talk today, I will have convinced you that when we think about contaminants, we're not merely thinking about that source of the contaminant emitting contaminants into the atmosphere, but rather about all three of these processes together. And today I'm going to be telling you a story about my favorite element, which is mercury. Uh, mercury is a potent neurotoxin, so if you're familiar with the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland, hatters used mercury to cure felt, and we're constantly inhaling this mercury, which led to the madness or the neurological impacts associated with mercury. But mercury can also cause less severe impacts, like tremors, loss of coordination, um, difficulty seeing. Um, in humans and then in animals, it can also alter behavior, survival, migration, and fertility. And for all these different impacts on both humans as well as on organisms, we have fish consumption advisories in many of our lakes throughout the United States as well as throughout the world to reduce the harms associated with uh, consuming large amounts of mercury. And so today I'm going to be telling you a story about mercury contamination and trying to understand how we can best mitigate the risk of mercury, both to people and to wildlife. And for this story, I'm going to bring you to the Madre Rios region of Peru, which is located in the southeastern portion of the country. This region is home to primary old growth forests and large unchannelized rivers like the Madre Rios River that you see here, which is a tributary to the Amazon River. But this landscape is being drastically altered as a result of artisanal and small-scale gold mining, which is drastically changing land cover features and converting this from a terrestrial ecosystem to a predominantly aquatic environment. Now, in the Peruvian Amazon alone, artisanal and small-scale gold mining involves about 70,000 miners, deforesting about 4,500 hectares per year in order to access about 80 tons of gold per year, and in the process, releasing over 180 tons of mercury per year. This is an illegal process, yet it occurs throughout the world in over 70 different countries where there are very similar statistics to what you see here. But in the Peruvian Amazon, we're particularly concerned about all of this because it's a biodiversity hotspot, home to the largest biodiversity of insects of anywhere on the planet, endangered species such as the giant river otter that you see on that bottom left there, and many other species. In the process of artisanal and small-scale gold mining, miners will clear large swaths of forest in order to make room for their mining equipment. They will then dredge up this gold-laden sediment from the bottoms of the riverbanks, and then they pass this, um, sediment, this gold-laden sediment down that wooden sleuth that you see there. And that wooden sleuth has a cloth-like material on it, and the small gold-laden particles will get stuck to that cloth, while the larger rock material are deposited as overburdened material on the side. At this point, mercury enters the picture. Mercury is used because it's really cheap, easy to obtain on the black market, and really efficient at isolating this gold from the rest of the sediment particles. And so they'll take this liquid elemental mercury, mix it up with this sediment slurry, and the mercury will form this coating around the gold, creating what's known as a mercury gold amalgam. This amalgam can then be brought to a gold buyer who will burn off that mercury, leaving behind gold that can be sold on the world market. This process is responsible for about one fifth of all the gold produced worldwide, so likely any of the jewelry that you're all wearing has some gold sourced from this process. But at the same time, this is also the primary source of, artis primary source of anthropogenic mercury emissions globally. So it's responsible for over one third of all the mercury released into the atmosphere, which is more than we see from coal combustion or any other activity. Now we care about mercury because of all the neurological effects that I told you about in the beginning. So once mercury is emitted into the atmosphere in various different forms, it can be transported far from its source of emission to a terrestrial environment or to an aquatic environment. Additionally, mercury can enter into the landscape by the dumping of tailings. And so I'm going to be showing you this biogeochemical cycling of mercury here in this aquatic environment, but the same, um, the same cycling can also happen in a terrestrial ecosystem as well. And so once this mercury enters into the landscape, 
It can then be converted into methylmercury via microbial activity, predominantly by sulfate-reducing bacteria, iron-reducing bacteria, methanogens, though we're constantly finding nucleides of microbes that can also um, methylate mercury. And then this methylmercury can get into the food web, bioaccumulating and biomagnifying as it moves up to higher trophic level species, which leads to higher levels of methylmercury higher on the food web. Now we know all of this about mercury biogeochemical cycling, but most of our studies on mercury have focused on the global north and not on the global south, where the source of mercury being emitted is iotic mercury, as opposed to this elemental mercury that we're seeing in gold mining landscapes. And of course, the ecosystem properties are very different in what's happening in the global south compared to in the global north. Not only that, nearly all the work on gold mining has, far as, has focused on quantifying the extent of this deforestation, which, as you can see from this, this photo, is very severe and important to quantify. But we also want to know what is happening to this mercury. And so that drives the three research questions that I'll be presenting to you today, which think about loading, transport transformation, and risk in forests, food webs, and aquatic ecosystems. So I'm going to begin by asking, how do mercury concentrations and depositional pathways vary with proximity to artisanal gold mining and leaf area index of regional canopies? And so this question is really getting at that loading or the movement of, the, of mercury from the atmosphere onto the landscape. And to do this, we looked at both remote sites and mining impacted sites in this Madre Rios region. Just so you can trust me when I tell you that this is mining impacted, I'm gonna zoom in and zoom in one more time. And you can see that this is, the landscape is covered by these mining ponds, which are indicative of gold mining activity. And so across this region, we established five different sites. Two sites were established in the remote areas. And these two sites both had old growth primary forest. Um, and we also had one site in the mining impacted area, Los Amigos, that was also old growth primary forest. Los Amigos is a valuable conservation concession that's occurring near to all this mining activity. And then we had two other mining impacted sites, uh, Boca, Colorado and Labyrinto, that both had young secondary growth forests. And not only that, these other two sites are located directly adjacent to these mining towns where that mercury gold amalgam is being burnt off. So really close to the source of emission. And um, so throughout all of these five sites, we collected our samples. And before moving into our methodology, I just want to highlight some key people that were part of our team. This is Ramiro Cordova Salas, who's a Peruvian who is really instrumental in helping us with site selection and in all of the sample collection. And so none of the data that I'm showing you today would be possible without Ramiro and his team. And then I also want to highlight two amazing teams of undergraduate students who helped in the field as well as the following academic year in the lab. Um, and a lot of their work is reflected in the data that I'm showing you today as well. Okay, so in all the figures that I'm showing you, we're comparing the remote sites and the mining impacted sites. In green, I'm showing you those sites that have primary old growth forests, and then in gray are the secondary growth forests close to the mining towns. And the first data I'm showing you now are looking at gaseous elemental mercury concentrations, which just represents the concentration of mercury in the air at these different sites. And so what we find is that, in general, the mining impacted sites have concentrations of gaseous elemental mercury that are 2 to 14 times higher than what we're seeing in the remote sites. And this is particularly true when we think about the dry season, which is when all that mining activity is happening. The wet season, it rains a lot, and there's much reduced mining activity occurring. Um, so this is as we would expect. We would expect to see that where there's mining, there's higher mercury in the atmosphere, um, and the concentrations of mercury in those remote sites reflect background concentrations of mercury for the southern hemisphere. The next thing we looked at was inputs of mercury via precipitation. So we set out collectors in clearings as well as in forested areas. These clearings allow us to look at bulk precipitation, while in the forested areas, we can look at the collection of dry deposition or through fall. And essentially what we were trying to do was think about the various different pathways by which mercury that's released into the atmosphere can re-enter into a terrestrial landscape. So that first pathway is that mercury can dissolve in rainwater, which can then fall to the forest floor or to a clearing in a process simply known as wet deposition or precipitation. And so we measure the, the mercury concentration in this bulk precipitation 
throughout all five of these different sites. And what we see is there's no difference in mercury concentration across all five sites. And not only that, the concentration is low. It's below what we see in the Adirondacks, which is often used as a reference point. This is a mountain area um, in New York, but it's also below concentrations that we see here in Michigan as well. All of which suggests that these low concentrations, this lack of difference, um, that there is no mercury entering into these systems from gold mining via this first pathway. Now the second pathway by which mercury can enter into a forest is that mercury can absorb to the surface of particles, such as dust or aerosols, that are then intercepted by leaves, and it can then fall to the forest floor in a process that's known as dry deposition or through fall. And we can measure this through our collectors that were placed out underneath the forest canopy. Now the one thing I'll note before I show you the data is that forested areas will always have higher mercury in the uh, in the collectors than in the deforested areas because the collectors are getting both the dry deposition and the wet deposition together. And so that's the pattern that you see, higher mercury underneath the forest canopy compared to in the clearings. But what should stick out to you here is that Los Amigos Biological Station has much more elevated mercury concentration compared to any of the other sites. Now, Los Amigos Biological Station is that valuable conservation concession with primary old growth forests that's directly adjacent to the mining activities. And in fact, these concentrations of mercury that we see here at Los Amigos exceed concentrations that we see in Guizhou, China, which is an area that has mercury mines, so cinnabar that's mined there, um, as well as industrial coal combustion. And this is all occurring within what we consider to be a fairly remote area in the Peruvian Amazon. And so we believe that this higher concentration of mercury that we're seeing occurring at Los Amigos is likely a result of both the proximity to mining activity as well as the presence of this forest structure. These leaves in this primary old growth forest have very large leaf area index, which increases the surface area for these dust particles and aerosol particles to, to uh, absorb onto and then for it to be uh, washed to the forest floor. And so we tested this hypothesis by putting out various different plots across Los Amigos with varying canopy densities and then measuring the concentration of mercury in the throughfall. Now, I will note that the canopy density here difference is pretty small, um, yet despite that difference, we still saw a trend in uh, canopy density and mercury um, concentrations in the throughfall, albeit with some um, variation, some deviations. So all of this suggests that the mercury inputs that we're seeing at, um, via throughfall at Los Amigos are really being driven by this canopy density, these old growth primary forests next to mining activity. And so returning to this conceptual figure, we see that the second pathway is a major source of mercury entering into these forested systems. The third way by which mercury can enter into a forest is that mercury can be taken up into the, their leaves as the stomata open and close for photosynthetic exchange. And then once they're incorporated into that leaf tissue, they can enter the forest floor when the leaves fall in a process known as litter fall. And so to look at the amount of mercury in leaves, we collected leaves via two different processes. The first is we found two species of trees that were found at all five sites. So this here is Ficus insipida, which is a giant fig tree. And we collected leaves from the tops of the canopies using a giant slingshot, um, which is a very fun field methodology to use. Um, and in such a way, we were able to get the leaves that were first intercepting that ma air mass of mercury rather than lower uh, leaves from lower in the tree canopy. And so we did this for two different tree species. And then we also collected just bulk litter from the forest floor as well, um, as well as through litter baskets, and measured all of this for mercury concentrations. So that left axis is showing you mercury from the leaves themselves, and the, y the right y-axis is showing you the, the litter traps that we put out. And what we found is that the mining impacted sites have higher mercury concentrations than what we saw in the remote sites. And this is particularly true at Boco, Colorado and Labyrintho, which have the highest concentrations of mercury. Um, and that's because Boco, Colorado and Labyrintho had higher gaseous elemental mercury concentrations, which is driving that higher uptake of mercury into the leaves. But I do want to note that while Boco, Colorado and Labyrintho had higher concentrations of mercury in leaves, 
the overall flux of mercury is higher at Los Amigos. Again, that primary old growth forest means more leaves falling down, a greater mass of, of leaves entering the forest floor, and so that overall leads to a higher flux of mercury via this pathway. Oop. And so we can compare the concentrations here to some other sites, and we see that all the mining impacted sites had values that exceeded what we see in the Adirondacks, they exceed what we see in Beijing, and then they're on par with some other sites in the Amazon, but some of our, our measurements uh, do exceed what we see even there. So this all, once again, suggests that this last pathway is an important source of mercury um, to the forest floor as well. And so now that we know that mercury is entering into these forested environments and via what pathways, the next question is whether this mercury is being stored within the soils themselves. And so to get at that question, we looked at soil samples from the surface, so zero to five centimeters, and measured it for total mercury concentrations. And we did this at all five sites, once again in the deforested areas and in the forested areas. And so what you'll see here first is that this one site at Boca, Colorado, the deforested area, has really high concentrations of mercury. This to us suggests that there is actually mercury amalgamation occurring right there and likely a, a spill of mercury. And in fact, I um, essentially blew out the mercury amalgamator on our instrument in measuring these samples. So some fairly high samples there. Um, but if we remove that as a, as a potential source of, of direct mercury contamination, the only other site that has significantly higher mercury concentrations to the rest is Los Amigos Biological Station, where you can see the values are all fairly tightly coupled. Um, all these data have been collected over multiple seasons um, and multiple years, yet we see that at Los Amigos, uh, it's consistently higher than everywhere else. The same site that we saw those really high inputs of mercury. And this site also exceeds the US EPA soil standard. Not only that, um, we saw that these concentrations of mercury are elevated all the way down to 100 centimeters in depth at Los Amigos, which suggests that this mercury is penetrating into the soil and leading to large amounts of um, mercury contamination at this one particular site, whereas we don't see this trend at the other sites. Um, I also want to note that in our soils samples, uh, the source of mercury in all of them was verified through mercury isotopes um, done by our collaborators at the University of Toronto, who identified that mercury in these soils was originating from artisanal and small-scale gold mining and was not just naturally occurring in this area. So next, we compared the concentration of mercury in precipitation to the concentration of mercury in soils. And when we did this for the clearings, we see no patterns at all, which makes sense. There was no difference in mercury concentration in that bulk precipitation anywhere. But in the through-fall comparison to the soil mercury concentrations, we see um, a fairly strong pattern um, that higher concentrations of mercury in through-fall are leading to higher concentrations of mercury in the soil, all of which suggests that this depositional pathway is driving the patterns of mercury that we're seeing in these soil systems. And so now we can think about all of this in a pull and flux diagram because I am an ecosystem ecologist and I can't get away from these diagrams. And so pulls, uh, sorry, fluxes represent inputs into the system and pulls represent storage within the soils themselves. And I'm sharing you data here for total mercury and then in parentheses is percent methylmercury, which I haven't mentioned at all in this talk. Um, throwing that up there in case anyone's interested and happy to field any questions later about it. But what you can see here is that in the deforested areas from any of the sites, fairly low inputs of mercury, some storage of mercury within that soils. But when we compare that to Los Amigos Biological Station in the forested areas, we see the highest ever reported fluxes of mercury into a system from any location around the globe, and the highest ever reported uh, flux of mercury via throughfall from anywhere in the globe. Not only that, we see that this is leading to enhanced storage of mercury within the soil systems, compared to within the deforested areas. Now, um, this research was uh, important in showing that we need to start thinking about terrestrial ecosystems and not just aquatic environments. And so one of the main things with artisanal and small scale gold mining is most of our focus has been to date on understanding mercury inputs and methylation processes within rivers and ponds, which as an aquatic ecologist is originally what drew me to this area. 
Um, but it's showing that we need to think about these terrestrial systems as well and some of the linkages that might be there. And so to return to the original research question that I asked about what is the loading of this mercury into forested ecosystems, what we see is that loading is influenced by both proximity to mining and forest structure. So it's not one of those alone that's important, but having these old growth primary forests, these important conservation areas that are occurring directly adjacent to mining activities that's driving these really high inputs of mercury. And so the next question is whether this mattered at all to forest food webs, to think about this bioaccumulation risk. Because again, what we really care about here, particularly in Peru, is the large biodiversity that lives in these forests. And so the second question we asked is, is there evidence that mercury bioaccumulation is elevated in forest-dwelling resident songbirds near artisanal and small-scale gold mining activity? And so this allows us to think about this inputs of mercury and whether it is actually entering into the food web. And so to do this, we partnered with some collaborators from Field Projects International who collected bird feathers for us from three different species, two insectivorous species and one frugivorous species, so insect eating and fruit eating. And we collected tail feathers, which is indicative of blood mercury concentrations. And we looked at Los Amigos, the location where we saw those really high inputs of mercury, and compared it to Cochacashu, which is a field station located about a two-day boat journey from Los Amigos, so far upriver, um, away from these sources of mercury. And we compared these concentrations of mercury in all three birds to what's known as the EC10, the EC20, and the EC30, or the effective concentration at which reproduction is impaired by 10%, 20%, or 30%. So if you exceed that line, you're likely going to have uh, reduced fecundity, reduced survival of your young. And so what we found was that Los Amigos birds always exceeded the concentration of birds at Koshikachu by 2 to 12 times. And not only that, none of the individuals from Kochakashu even came close to that EC10 line, whereas many individuals at Los Amigos are showing evidence um, of concentrations that are known to cause reproductive harm. I'll remind you that these are at most insect-eating birds, so you can begin to think what the concentrations of mercury might be in carnivorous birds, um, scavengers, and this, particularly those that are large birds like the harpy eagle or other charismatic species that we find um, in the Peruvian rainforest. And so once again, this research shows the importance of thinking beyond just the aquatic ecosystem and beyond just aquatic birds um, to thinking about what the implications might be for this forest food webs. And so I just want to take a moment now to highlight that when I, a really important part of the work that I do is communicating beyond academia. And so in addition to writing this research up in a scientific publication, which obviously is important to do, I included a translation and in supplemental information in Spanish to make the report more available to colleagues within Latin America. And then additionally, I uh, published a policy brief that I shared with NGOs as well as government officials throughout um, Peru and other locations in Latin America, telling about the implications of the findings and following it up with a companion article that I wrote in Scientific American as a popular press article to make this information um, more broadly known. Um, and then it was also taken up by some major news outlets. Um, and the, the main uh, reason, not only do we care about biodiversity in the Amazon, but I think, again, it kind of threw on its head this idea that it's only aquatic ecosystems that we need to be concerned about here. And so to return to this research question of what is the implications for forest food webs in terms of bioaccumulation risk, what we found is that songbirds in mining areas are, in fact, bioaccumulating mercury uh, with levels of mercury that are shown to cause reproductive harm. And so we need to be thinking about the implications of this mercury within these important conservation areas. Now the last question um, that we wanted to think about was what's happening in aquatic ecosystems, the original um, impetus for my work in this area. And we can think about this a lot because these important conservation areas that we've now identified as having large amounts of mercury loading are often being cleared and being replaced by these ponds. And so what does that mean for the transformation of mercury? We know that lakes and ponds have these anoxic conditions, and the anoxic conditions promote that formation of methylmercury, and methylmercury is a form of mercury that's toxic and can bioaccumulate. 
And so what we asked is, how does artisanal gold mining change the extent of riverine and lake environments and the production of methylmercury? So to answer that research question, I collaborated with Simon Topp, who you can see here um, collecting samples with me in Peru. Um, he was then a, a PhD student at the University of North Carolina, and now is at the USGS. And together we were measuring the hydroscape, or the extent of ponding across the landscape, um, using remote sensing. So here you can see imagery from 1987. It's Landsat imagery, some of the first available, so it's pretty large pixel size. But hopefully you can see that the landscape is completely brown or river, sorry, completely green or river, so forest or water environments. Compare that to what we see in the same exact locations in 2020, where that forest has been converted into mining ponds, and even that river landscape has been transformed, obviously both by some changes naturally, since um, it's non-channelized river, but a lot of that change is occurring due to mining activity. And so Simon and I set out to quantify the extent to which ponding has expanded on this landscape in order to understand how landscapes are changing with gold mining activity. And so what we did was to calculate the percent lake area change in those two watersheds over time and then compare it to other watersheds in Peru known to have only minimal amounts of mining activity. And so what we found is that in those two heavily mined watersheds, shown in red, there's been a large increase in uh, percent lake area over time by about 670%. While in those, mining, in those watersheds with only minor amounts of mining activity, there's been no change in lake area over time. And if we look at the timing of when we're seeing this increase uh, in lake area, we see that it begins in the early 2000s, which is the same time period that we know that mining is increasing on the landscape. Um, mining, gold mining activity worldwide increased in 2008 with the recession, which bounced gold prices up. Um, and then widespread gold mining activity has been occurring ever since. So all of this suggests that we can, in fact, use remote sensing to quantify the extent to which lake area is increasing. So then the next question was trying to understand what does all of this mean for mercury transport and transformation processes? And so we collected water and sediment samples from river reaches as well as from mining ponds and oxbow lakes in order to address this question. So I'm going to begin by showing you concentrations of total mercury um, in upstream and downstream of mining activity. And what we see is that downstream rivers have 10 times the mercury loads than upstream rivers. So with all of this deforestation and the creation um, and this alteration in the landscape, huge amounts of uh, mercury is being mobilized, likely bound to sediment materials, and then transported in the river downstream of this mining activity. But while it's important to know that there is more mercury transport there, that doesn't tell us anything about the bioavailability of this mercury to organisms. And so to get at that, we really need to be thinking about methylmercury, the form of mercury that can bioaccumulate and biomagnify. And so we looked at percent methylmercury, or percentage of mercury as methylmercury, which represents the ratio of methylmercury to total mercury. So the higher the percent, the more the mercury is being methylated in these systems. And we compared it across rivers, oxbow lakes, and mining ponds. And as you would expect, what we see is that there's higher mercury methylation happening in these oxbow lakes and mining ponds compared to in the rivers. And not only that, the amount of mercury methylation happening in these mining ponds and oxbow lakes is about an order of magnitude higher than what we're seeing in the forests. So even though it's important to think about these forest systems and the amount of mercury that can bioaccumulate in them, it's really in these aquatic environments that we're seeing these huge mercury methylation rates. Now, this all suggests that there's a synergistic increase of both mining activity, uh, creating these mining ponds, these perfect conditions for mercury methylation, and these huge pulses of mercury that are entering via mining activity as well. So together, we're creating this environment that is much more e efficient and effective at leading to higher methylmercury concentrations in the environment. And so we know this now about Peru, but what does this mean for all the different locations with artisanal and small-scale gold mining? ASGM happens in over, fifth, sorry, over 70 different countries around the world. And we know that in all of these cases, mercury is being used to extract the gold. And so the next step was to think about whether there's also changes in the amount of ponding happening 
in these different locations. And so we selected three different locations um, from three different continents where there is mining activity and looked at the extent of ponding across these different landscapes and compared it to those two watersheds in Peru. So here we're looking at Venezuela, Ghana, and Indonesia. And what we see is that in all three of these locations that we chose at random um, from the mining activity locations, we are seeing this rapid expansion of, mining, of ponding occurring beginning in the early 2000s. And you can see that quantitatively as well as spatially. And so regardless of the extent of mining, where there's lots of mining happening in Venezuela and Indonesia, and to a lesser extent in Ghana, we see this, this ponding that is uh, representative of mining activity. And so this suggests that globally we are creating um, environments that are much better at methylating mercury and that could lead to higher methylmercury concentrations within the food web. And so once again, I just want to share that I not only translated the whole manuscript into Spanish, but wrote a policy brief brief in English and Spanish that I shared with policymakers um, and NGOs to make this information more widely available so that it could be used to guide some of our decisions about conservation. And so to return to this final research question about aquatic ecosystems and transformation, we see that mining ponds lead to enhanced methylmercury production on the landscape, which have really important implications both for the animals that live in these systems, but also for the indigenous populations that rely on fish from these aquatic environments. And so through all of this, we see that artisanal and small scale gold mining really increases the mercury risk landscape. We see that mercury deposition into forests is dependent on both proximity to mining and leaf area index, which collectively are leading to enhanced mercury accumulation um, and mercury deposition within these primary old growth forests near gold mining. We see that mercury is in fact accumulating in the terrestrial food web near mining activity, leading to elevated concentrations of mercury in songbirds. And then we see that forests are being replaced with ponds, which have enhanced mercury transformation into methylmercury, posing a greater risk on the landscape. And then finally, these synergistic impacts of mining expansion and mercury loading are not isolated to Peru, but are occurring in artisanal and small scale gold mining sites globally. And the results of all this suggest the importance of continuing to protect our forests in order to better protect the organisms living in those forests, as well as the organisms living in the aquatic environments. And so as we remove these forests, we are mobilizing all of that mercury into these aquatic environments that can cause even more harm. And the ultimate goal of this, of course, is to better conserve our biodiversity in these forests, as well as to protect the local communities that live here. And so I hope with this part of the presentation so far, I've now convinced you that when we think about bioaccumulation risk, it's not merely what's entering into the atmosphere, but rather the loading transformation and transport processes that are really driving how much of that contaminant is getting into the food web. And so now I just want to end with um, two more points that are often the first questions that I get when I give this talk. So I thought I would share this information um, ahead of time about how we can look beyond to think about human health implications and solutions. Um, and so the work that I'm showing you now, I just want to highlight is the work of two amazing undergraduates uh, who presented, who compiled this data as part of their, uh, thes their senior theses. And the first question asks, is mercury from artisanal gold mining entering into various different foodstuffs, such as crops and chickens? And do these food items pose a risk to humans? And the second is, how can we, we reduce our mercury emissions from artisanal gold mining? <coughs> so I'm going to begin by showing you some of Melissa's work, uh, which is currently in review, um, looking at mercury concentrations in foodstuff. And so here, this is showing you um, the Peruvian Amazon from mining impacted areas, which you can see from the pink um, all the way up into some more remote areas. And she collected a variety of different food items, including fish, crops, um, chickens and chicken eggs in order to examine whether these are important um, sources of exposure of mercury. The idea behind this is there's a lot of um, educational campaigns occurring in Peru as well as many other countries globally about reducing fish consumption um, to reduce mercury exposure. But fish is also an important source of protein and other nutrients to a lot of local populations. And so we wanted to determine are fish really the items that are most 
uh, the largest exposure of, of mercury risk to people, or are there some other items we should also be concerned about? And so she um, determined the mercury concentration in a variety of different crops, um, and interestingly found that potatoes had the highest concentration of mercury. Um, and we're not quite sure what the drivers of that are. Um, to follow up some follow-up study that I'm doing now in Ghana, I'm trying to look at what the drivers are of mercury uptake into various different crop items. Um, but then in terms of methylmercury, the potatoes had much lower um, concentrations, but rice, as you probably would expect, has, much, uh, has elevated methylmercury concentrations. The flooded paddy soils um, drive anoxic conditions, although interestingly here, some of these rice samples are from dry paddies where there's not that wetting drying cycle, yet we still see elevated methylmercury. Um, but so she looked at these, these different uh, crop concentrations, and then she also found that mercury concentrations are particularly elevated in eggs, um, more so than what you see in chickens. And so knowing all this information, ultimately what we wanted to do was construct different diets. And so we looked at three different diets, a typical Peruvian breakfast, a typical Peruvian lunch, and a typical Peruvian dinner, and determined how much mercury loading you would get from eating these three different items. And in the middle one, um, so you have uh, plantain, rice, and eggs, and for, for breakfast, you have um, a, a fish for lunch, and then you have chicken for dinner. And that fish species could also vary too. So what she did was put together these different diets and found that, yes, in fact, eating a fish-laden diet is the largest source of mercury, but it depends on the type of fish you eat. So if you eat a bagre, which is a type of catfish, you're going to be exposed to large amounts of mercury. But if you eat two eggs for breakfast, you actually have more mercury loading than you would if you ate a paco, which is another type of fish. And so we really need to think about our messaging and making sure we're being really specific when we're advising people on what, fish they sh what foods they should and shouldn't be eating to reduce their mercury exposure. Um, so that is one important um, piece, is thinking about how can we better educate communities to ensure that they can reduce the risk, particularly when those communities are not involved in mining activities at all, but are suffering some of the repercussions of the nearby mining activities. The next research um, that I want to uh, explain here is thinking about how we can reduce these mercury emissions in artisanal and small-scale gold mining communities. And this is some work where I'm going to actually bring you away from Peru for a bit to some work I did in Senegal. Um, and this research took place in Senegal because after I had um, conducted some work on gold mining there, the community has turned to me and said, well, what can we do to reduce our mercury exposure? And so I presented them with all the information I knew about mercury and said, well, now what do you suggest could be some solutions? And when I say I, I mean my team of people. I was working very closely with um, several Senegalese collaborators, and this was all being done in local languages. Um, so in French is the official language, but we were speaking to them in some of their native languages. Um, and what they suggested was two things. One, better education, because um, they were not, until that moment, had not been aware of what the symptoms of mercury toxicity were, and so hadn't associated what they were uh, seeing as being potentially caused by mercury. And secondly, they wanted uh, a mercury capture device, which I'll explain in a second. And so what we did was to, um, to conduct a educational campaign. And so um, we created some visuals uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we translated into French and trained locals to go into communities and present this information within local languages. And so here, this is showing pathways that mercury has transmitted, symptoms of mercury toxicity, and how you can reduce your mercury exposure. And so that was step number one. And then the second step, um, in addition to the educational trainings, was this distribution of what's called a retort. Now, a retort looks, works kind of like a pot lid. So if you think about here, you're burning that mercury gold amalgam in step number one. Normally, that, that all those emissions that you see in step number two just go into the atmosphere and everyone inhales it, um, or it's transported and deposited, as I showed you earlier. But with this retort, instead that mercury will be transported into this bucket of water, and that mercury can then be captured. Once that mercury gold amalgam, once that, that retort cools down, you can then remove the gold in step four and also remove that mercury and reuse the mercury. And this process has been shown to capture somewhere between 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 95 percent of that mercury. So it's not completely efficient, and ideally they'd, they'd stop using mercury, but the reality is that mercury is the best 
method available to them. And so reducing mercury exposures is one source to, to mercury emissions is one way to make this a safer process. And so we determine the efficacy of these two different interventions um, through pre and post surveys. And so we ask people um, many different questions, three of which you can see here, whether they believe mercury is dangerous, whether they believe retorts can reduce mercury exposure, and whether they've used a retort before. And what we find is that post-intervention, there's this increased knowledge of the danger of mercury, increased belief that retorts are effective, and increased use of retort use. Now, of course, this is not at 100%, so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But I think it's really promising in that we can actually increase knowledge and increase behavior through the interventions that we have um, that are really locally based, sourcing information from trusted community members, and building technology using locally available resources. Um, and I also want to note that these results were seen not just in the intervention communities, but also in the control communities, suggesting the social spillover effect that people are sharing information and resources widely. Um, so with that, I just want to end by returning to this idea of a bioaccumulation risk landscape, leaving this um, fresh in your minds, and hopefully uh, showing you that there are some things that we can do to, to reduce um, the exposure of people in these communities to mercury. So thank you very much. I have a sort of process of science question, which is yeah. how did you end up working in Peru in, and then in those particular communities? Like what got you to that particular <coughs> place? Yeah, so when, so originally the work that I was doing in gold mining was all in Senegal, and then when I um, was d trying to develop these larger research questions, decided to partner with some global health experts who had been working in Peru for a while. So that's what drew me to Peru. They had been working across the region. Um, and those five sites were chosen as locations that were somewhat equal distance um, and across this gradient. So we wanted a gradient of, prime, of old growth forests and um, younger forests, and then also distance from the mining activity. And just capacity-wise, five sites was the maximum that we could do in terms of how many um, deposition collectors would fit into our boat. So we were traveling up and down river and impossible to have, there would have been no room for us otherwise. And so that's how we got to those particular sites. And then, sorry, Kochakashi was just a, which is where we did that bird comparison, is a comparison uh, biological station that we compared it to. But some of the sites that we were at were communities where people were living, and some was just a patch of forest that we went into. Sure. That's really great. Uh, um, I was just wondering, how do you work with gold miners who may be considered criminals um, by local officials. So like, like in Peru, wouldn't police rather just round them up and shoot them to get rid of them <laughs> as opposed to working with them? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so this is where the thing is vary by country. And that's the intervention that I did was done in Senegal because it's a very different dynamics there than the dynamics in Peru. Um, in Peru, I never told anyone I was sampling for mercury. Uh, no, no, different than any of the miners. I would tell the local communities that that's what we were doing. Um, and I was telling someone the story earlier, but when I think there's a lot of misconceptions that we have about who miners are as well. And so I would just tell people I'm, I'm testing water quality, which is a true statement, a little bit of a stretch, but I am looking at the quality of what's in the water. And one time I had a conductivity probe in the water and a miner asked what we were doing and I said testing water quality and he said, oh, what's the conductivity of the water? And so I think like that took me aback for a moment and then it's just a good reminder of we have these assumptions about who's mining but there's people of all different educational levels and all different backgrounds who are engaging in this different activities. Um, that's that I still didn't tell them I was, I was testing for mercury and uh, mercury there is a bit of a touchy subject but I could also go into a store and buy mercury even though it's illegal to buy and it's all on the black market. Um, I also never, there's communities I wouldn't go into or I wouldn't sleep in 
uh, not just because I'm a woman, but also because I'm an American. And so um, it was balancing that a little bit. In the context of Senegal, though, it's very different and it's very community oriented. And even though it's all illegal activity, they create these these communities within these mining towns. And it's, it's also very transient, so it's constantly changing who's there. Um, but there, we're actually able to like have very direct conversations with miners um, and talk to them about their practices and where they're getting their gold, from, their mercury from, and where they're selling their gold. And so, the the construct of how mining happens, the types of interactions you have, are yeah pretty country specific or regional specific. I'd say that that, from my understanding, what I, the experience that I had in Senegal characterizes a lot of West Africa, and the experience I had in Peru characterizes a lot of. Uh, Latin America, but there are also exceptions within those places as well. Sure. Uh, great talk. Thanks. <coughs> um, so, how much is it getting into the food web beyond those things? Do we know that? Like, I mean, have people not sampled, but you, you obviously have some fish data. Mm -hmm. and it makes sense the bagre is going to be heavier than the, and I guess I don't know about the coal, but the food. Yeah. But so, like, what do we know? Like, what do we know? How about a tape here? How about a. a yeah. Spirit? Do you know? Does anyone know? Or no one knows. Um, yeah, so this is one of those things where just not a lot of people have looked at trying to understand these larger, what we, I'd almost say, are fundamental questions. We still don't know the answers to. Um, there's a study that some of my colleagues who I collaborated with on this project did. Um, it's in review now, looking at mercury concentrations across a variety of different um, bird species. So I think they have over 70 different species that they captured from different locations to look at concentrations there. But that's just purely a, a capturing birds. We still don't know like the insects to the birds to other, um, other animals. Giant river otters have been shown to have elevated concentrations of mercury. Makes sense. They're in the they're in Oxbow Lakes and they're consuming large amounts of fish and they're quite large um, and long lived. Um, bats have been shown to be elevated, um, but there's not great food web dynamics like linking things together with you know carbon nitrogen isotopes and so forth. So I think that there's a lot of interesting important questions that we still don't know the answers to both within the forest food web but even within the aquatic food web of the different um, like how are in, in aquatic ecosystems where you have these huge sediment loadings, you're definitely you're, we know we're changing uh, food web structure, the length of the food web, what's living there, um, but we have we don't have any measurements yet for that. So lots of interesting remaining questions to ask. Yeah. The forests are, are clearly capturing a lot of the mercury. How much methylation by microbes do you think? actually going on in the forest canopy. Yeah, so this is what we were chatting about earlier, and I'm just going to move back. So this, this is what I alluded to before. And so um, this concentration that's in parentheses represents a percentage of mercury present as methylmercury. And in the third hall, we're finding 9% of mercury present as methylmercury, which is unheard of concentration, like percentage methylation from any other site that I've seen measurements from globally. And so to me, usually through fall, methylmercury is like maybe 1% if it's measurable at all. To me, that means that something really interesting is happening in that forest canopy. And that could be soil formation up in the, ca the canopies of these tropical forests. And there's some sort of mercury methylation happening. Uh, it could be mercury methylation on the surface of leaves. We know that there's some greenhouse gas production by microbes that um, live on leaf surface, and so possibly they're also methylating mercury. It could be that there is some uh, leaves that are capturing um, capturing rainwater and forming their own like aquatic ecosystem up in the canopy. Um, that's methylating mercury. So those are all my hypotheses, and it's something that is way outside my wheelhouse to go after, but something I'm super interested in thinking about and trying to understand is why and how is this mercury methylation happening up in the canopy when we only ever think about it as happening, well, mostly in, in, in rivers and lakes and then a little bit in soils, but now maybe there's this other 
we need to start thinking a little bit more three dimensional. Yeah. Is there a risk of this marker I mean, infiltrating into the groundwaters and then popping somewhere you wouldn't expect, especially in wells that people have by their you know, sediments? Yeah, certainly it can. Um, this is, I don't, I admittedly don't know too much about the hydrology in this system. It's super clay, so I don't know how much is penetrating in. Um, but it, it certainly could be a source of, of mercury. I know we see that in other locations throughout the world that the mercury can get into the groundwater and be transported that way. Um, in, in those cases, it's usually more of the inorganic mercury that's getting in, but then it could pop in somewhere else and be methylated. The thing, other thing I will say though is that, well, you shouldn't drink this water because there's a lot of other things going on, <laughs> but you mercury-wise, you could drink this water and be okay. It's that methylmercury bioaccumulating up the food web or biomagnifying up the food web that is really causing the harm for the ingestion. And so with the methylmercury concentrations that we're seeing, I wouldn't be too concerned about somebody drinking it. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so you mentioned the one kind of anomalous soil sample when you believe that there was uh, a spill that occurred. And I was just wondering if you knew, because um, generally when we think about a lot of pollutants, we think about that sort of like spills, things like that. Um, so I was wondering if you knew to what extent a lot of this pollution is occurring through these kind of more airborne uh, burning of these things versus um, accidents and spills and introducing it kind of in its raw form into the environment. Yeah, so the ratio of mercury to gold use varies by country. Um, and so it's anywhere from a two to one ratio to a 12 to one ratio, depending on where you are. Um, so the amount of excess mercury that you have is gonna, in your amalgamation process, is gonna determine how much is being dumped as tailings on the landscape. Uh, but they say that about they being at people who've done estimates as part of, so there was a Minamata Convention on Mercury that went into effect in 2017. And so each individual country is required to uh, develop a national action plan. And as part of that, there's been a lot of assessments and that's how we know this varying ratio. Um, and then there's been these like estimates of how much do we think is being dumped versus how much being emitted as part of these assessments. And so the idea is likely about 60% dumped on the landscape versus 40% entering into the atmosphere, though there's huge error bars. Um, so we don't really know. <laughs> um, but it, the, because that mercury is being dumped as elemental mercury, it's local, likely staying fairly localized. But even that extent of how far it's then going, we don't know either. Or is some of that mercury then being evaded into the atmosphere? Unknown. And then what happens to all that mercury that's burnt off? We also don't know the distance that it's going. That's part of this grant I have in Ghana is thinking about atmospheric pathways as well. But there's a long-winded explanation to your question. I don't know if I fully answered it, but OK, great. All right, well, let's thank Jackie again. That was amazing.